I'm a neonatologist and my background also a little bit on clinical pharmacology. So this is, I think, my main uh, conflict of interest is that, that I'm interested in drugs. Um, so and we, should be, we should realize we are just neonatologists. So we do not do surgery. At least I assume most of us do not do that. So actually drugs and the best way to dis prescribe them is actually the most effective intervention that we can do besides non pharmacological intervention. This holds true for both antibiotics as well as for the analgesia that we will discuss tomorrow. So um, the main message that I want to get across when we consider antibiotics is actually, and this is something that we feel normal, but it's not normal because it's your routine job, but it's not normal for people who are not used in our units. Neonatologists are working at the fast line of developmental life be it age or weight, changes are fast and dramatic. And obviously this means that they will be the main driver of the dosing of drugs that we need, also for antibiotics. Secondly, you're almost always right by saying this clearance will be low. But who the hell cares? In general, it will be somewhere between 1 and 10% of the adult dose, which means that within our units, we have a tenfold difference in prescribing practices between our different patients, intra and interpatient variability. So this means that um, despite all patients are small, that actually our prescribing practices are very various and there is extensive variability in that. So this means that we have to find out within neonates what makes the difference between different neonates. So this means we have to explore what we call in clinical pharmacology covariates. Is it weight? Is it uh, age? And if it is age, is it postnatal age or is it postmenstrual age or what are we are talking about? And if you try to apply these type of questions to antibiotics, it all goes down to three simple questions. When should I prescribe? What should I prescribe? And how? And with my background of clinical pharmacology, I would like to stress mainly the how thing. But let's first have a look at the other issues. This is to the very best of my knowledge, the most updated recent um, uh, overview on what types of drugs we do prescribe in neonates. It's pediatrics with an X. It's a, I think it owns a little bit half of the uh, US units, so it has a lot of data. And what you could see is the top 100 has been published of drugs commonly used. And within this top 100 of drugs, about 26 of the drugs are antibiotics. And in top five, three of the, these drugs are antibiotics. So that's for us the common stuff. And we may actually start to forget to think about because it's so common that we just do it as a reflex, uh, brainstem type of uh, medicine, and not always thinking of how should we give it and when should we give it. So it's quite common. When to prescribe? Well, we should be aware that we are actually quite poor performers. If you consider early onset sepsis, at about 10 or 12 percent of babies will be screened. Three percent, only three percent will have any evidence of a bacterial infection. So this means that even if you try to use any calculator to predict the potential risk that this is indeed an infection, that you will always be quite poor because in the balance between sensitivity and specificity, you do not want to miss a child which has indeed an infection or a serious infection at birth. So this means that 90 up to 95%, depending on how you use, how you try to limit a little bit your antibiotic use, will be, in retrospect, be uh, exposed without really needs for, for these antibiotics. It accounts for about 1% of admissions, but has a relevant impact of survival. And this is on mortality, because this is the very reason that we are so cautious about antibiotics. Neonates, they can be dead in a few hours, as we all know, of a serious infection, which is less likely, it occurs also in children, and less likely also in adults. And late onset sepsis, as had been discussed, it's all about prevention. I should not talk about antibiotics, I should talk about soap. The hell, wash your hands. I mean, that's what it all starts with, and this is actually what we were, what we were discussing before starting our lectures. But we should also realize that it is, if we have a uh, a high incidence of late onset sepsis that is not only a problem of today, of tomorrow, of prolonged stay, it has been repeatedly associ associated also with 
poor neurological de developmental outcomes. So actually, it's not only a quality marker for economics and for length of stay, it also will affect on the real relevant outcome of babies. Yes, we take a lot of blood cultures, and with the new definition, we even have to take more of them. But in general, there's only few positive um, results. And what you can see over here is a summary of both late and early onset type of sepsis, uh, infections. And what you could see, and I'll try to activate this. Could you help me? Wait, it was with the pencil, I think. Yeah. The highlighter. Or... Okay, sorry. I'm not so. But what you could see is actually we do take a lot of blood cultures at, neonat uh, at early neonatal life, but actually they are in general are very common negative. And the incidence of positive blood cultures actually goes up with time a little bit because these late onset sepsis, mainly CNS or similar, is, has a higher sensitivity if we take blood cultures. Culture negative sepsis, it exists. And actually what for me, and I think it's an important message also for neonatologists, this is not a disease that only we have invented. It also ex exists in adult intensive care. And the interesting thing is that if you look at mortality, that patients or even adult patients are even more likely to die of a culture negative sepsis than from a culture proven sepsis. So the syndrome is not only specific to neonates, but if you look at the incidence of this type of data, it's all about one in six, up to one in 16 cases actually is only a positive case while the others are classified as, well, this is culture negative sepsis, but we feel discomfortable, so we will continue. And a little bit similar to other definitions, there's quite a broad variety as recently have been published, broad variety of, uh, broad variety of definitions used to classify something as being a culture negative sepsis. But having said that, there's still a lot of extensive variability within units also on antibiotic use. And in the US, they described even up to a 40-fold variability. I think it was again using this pediatrics type of um, data sets, in part driven by surgery, because if you do surgery, you will have prophylactic type of practices. But also neck, proven infections, level of care and mortality, but only a limited amount of these data were indeed proven. Can we do better? Not sure how, what type of biomarkers you use in your unit, but you should be aware that if you're trying to focus on early diagnosis, that actually you have to focus on other type of biomarkers if you compare it to I want to confirm. What you could see on this slide is that if you really want to focus on an early marker in the very first hours of an infection, that it seems to be that IL-6 or IL-8 uh, is actually the most sensitive marker, but it disappears. So if you think this child has already been sick for quite a time and only take IL-6, you can actually end up with a problem that IL-6 is already going down, despite the fact that this child has a relevant infection. Procalcitonin and CRP are the well, other ones which are commonly used. So this dynamics means that actually you, it may be more appropriate to use something like a mixture which has also been recently described, be it for late on subsets. What you could see over here is when you consider the sensitivity specificity curve, that the combination of CRP and ELA6 was indeed a better marker when compared only to procalcitonin. And only CRP or only EL6 were even poorer um, predictors of indeed confirmed late on sepsis. So we have new tools in our hands, and it becomes a little bit more complicated because one tool will not always give you a final solution, as was also the conclusion of this uh, paper, where they say, well, you have to make combinations in order to make things a little bit better in your clinical care and your de clinical decision tree. What are we targ targeting for? Well, it's obviously different if you consider early onset sepsis versus late onset sepsis. And for the early onset, it may also be different whether you are practicing in an area where there is prophylactic during uh, delivery for uh, group B streptococcus or not, but at least you can either end up with gram-negative organisms with E. coli the topper, or with gram-positive uh, organisms including CNS and strep B. While candida albicans is in general still quite rare for the early on sepsis. So this means if you would like to target from an empiric 
because that when you take your blood curves, you do not know yet what pathogen you are focusing on, that these are the type of choices that you can make. And this is recent German work where they actually questioned a lot of neonatal intensive care unit on their practices. What do you give for early onset sepsis? And what turned out was quite common, a combination of an aminoglycoside, gentamicin, tobramicin, and yes, my favorite, amikacin, but it's just a personal thing, um, and ampicillin. While other cephalosporins or other uh, drugs of, in my uh, perception, fortunately, much less used. For late on sepsis, vancomycin in German Heinz is a topper, but cefotaxim and a lot of other drugs also came across, perhaps also in part whether you would consider that this is what was necrotizing enterocolitis or quote unquote just a late onset sepsis. For those who are still struggling with why the hell do we continue to give aminoglycosides because you have to con uh, check it for TDM and this type of stuff, it's boring, it's not easy, it's complex dosing, there is an argument and this argument is not so much at the level of the individual patient, but at the level of your unit. And this is perhaps a relatively complex slide, but I'll walk you through. These are data from Rotterdam before I was there, but at least what it shows, to get started, this is a year. So the first year until week 52. And for those who haven't been in Rotterdam, you have different units. So what these colleagues did is switch antibiotic therapy between different units for empiric treatment of infections at uh, delivery. And what you could see, all dots are pathogens isolated with swaps, which are resistant either to the treatment currently used or to the treatment used on the other unit. And what you can see, unfortunately, is the amox uh, amoxicillin uh, cefotaxin regime was actually much poorer in performing in unit A. Now it's one, two, three, so you cannot recognize the numbers anymore. It's NICU A, and when they switched the treatment, actually this resistance appeared in the other unit, while the other way around, in the units where tobramycin was combined with penicillin, the overall incidence of resistance was way, way, way much lower, and the majority was actually still resistant to the other treatment regime, not to the treatment regime admitted on the unit. So my main message is I'm fully aware that the selection for the go, still go for an aminoglycoside in combination with a simple penicillin is perhaps not the easiest way, but for your population, it may actually be the best way. And you subsequently try to switch from empiric to targeted. So once you know your pathogen, you have to adapt your treatment modality and try to focus on a targeted treatment uh, strategy, um, also considering potential safety or overexposure or underexposure of a given drug. And this is where clinical pharmacology comes in. Because it's not only what you will give and when you will give, but it's also how. That may be a very important outcome variable of your treatment. And clinical pharmacology is all about PK and PD. PK is uh, a give a given drug, it distributes, and it gives a given concentration in the blood, and subsequently will disappear. It's all about absorption, distribution, uh, metabolism, but not so relevant for antibiotics, and subsequent elimination. Pharmacodynamics is what we're really interested in. We want to kill the bug for antibiotics, or we, will, we want to treat the pain. But you have to be aware that this pharmacokinetics is actually the main driver of this pharmacodynamics, especially for antibiotics, because even at the EMA level, I think that I have a slide somewhere in there, even at the EMA and FDA level, it's generally perceived that the most important thing that we need to have in neonates is pharmacokinetics. Because once we're there, we can collect safety data and we know enough to give this drug in specific conditions. We all know that antibiotics have different mechanisms to work and some focus on cell wall, others focus more on intracellular things. And this matters because it's that will, that will drive or area under the curve or on pharmacodynamic target. Should we aim for a P concentration, so shoot and go, or is it all about sustained a, above a given concentration? And this is how we should try to understand uh, the dosing regimes. And this is somewhat illustrated in this slide. If you want to have beta lactams effective, what is really relevant is that we stay as long as possible in adults, one generally say, well, 40% or 50% above MIC is sufficient. In neonates, we generally feel, okay, these babies are more, 
or less capable to fight against the faction, so let's go for 60 or 80, there's no real consensus. But anyhow, the target is the time above a given lower concentration. So remain above, it doesn't matter how high you shoot, as long as you remain above a given threshold. Aminoglycosides is the other way around. Aminoglycosides is shoot hard and run away. Because the drug will work even if it is no longer in the body. Which sounds perhaps a little bit weird, but the way that I try to explain it to colleagues is, while this exists, imagine radiotherapy. Your patient is treated for a few minutes, and then he's go away for a few days, and he may come back for the next session. So that's the same concept that we use for aminoglycosides, and I will explain why it is. And vancomycin is a little bit in between. It has some threshold values, but likely also the peaks may also matter. So the, re, the way that we trans, trans, try to translate this is all about adding under the curve. So it's not only the peak, it's also the lower level that matters. So it's a little bit mathematics. So and this relates to how it works. Penicillins will rupture the membrane, so the continuous presence will actually, it's a bombardment, continuous bombardment against the wall of the bacteria. And this is the way that it has to get across. And resistance has to do with transporters, all the stuff that actually this uh, penicillin doesn't get in or cephalosporin doesn't get in. I mean, the glycosides, they wreck the machinery. I mean, the glycosides, their focus is the ribosome. And you may still know from our initial training that ribosomes are made to convert RNA into proteins. Yes? So it's all about translation. So what aminoglycosides do is to actually disrupt this translation process. And by this way, they disrupt protein synthesis. They disrupt the machinery of the antibiotic, of the, of the uh, bacteria. And in this way, it's not about being all the time there, just going in, destroy the system, and then go out and let the system fail. So this is how it works. And this is the reason that the post-antibiotic, and it's difficult to also, well, at least, I, it took me some years to understand that how, can, how does this bug still know that we have been there? Uh, um, talking from the point of an antibiotic. But they do, because actually they destroy the system. And in this way, you can understand that this is dysfunctional. And you can even perhaps understand why synergism works. If you combine a penicillin, which makes the cell wall a little bit more permeable so that the anti uh, antimicrobial gets in easier, you can understand why these drugs together are more potent than all these drugs uh, on their own. So that's the very reason that if we go for aminoglycoside use, that what is generally known in humans is a single dose. In neonates, there is a problem because the single dose actually results in a much more further extended time interval, and there is indeed, but you can do some modeling on that, on that, some questioning whether you can be on 48, 60 hours while, and does this pathogen still knows that the aminoglycosides have been there? But you can model that to a certain extent. But at least, aminoglycosides, it's all about shoot hard and wait long enough. And this wait long enough has to do with toxicity. By accident, I already explained that, that the synergism has actually to do with the fact that if you destroy the cell wall, aminoglycosides get in easier, and actually in this way, they can be more effective. So if you have these concepts, I hope I can get you through some nice pharmacokinetic uh, approaches of this uh, issue. As I already alluded to, pharmacokinetics, it's all about concentration time. And pharmacokinetics is fun because you can always publish it. You have data, it doesn't matter, but you have data so you can get them out to the public. The only thing that really matters to us clinicians is obviously the pharmacodynamics. What type of effect will I achieve, both efficacy as well as safety? Because we should be aware that safety is also a crucial part of pharmacodynamics. So, and if we do that in babies, we actually always will aim for a moving target because the child is actually maturing during a treatment. And this is what makes us a little bit typical. But um, this is what neonatology is all about. And this is a slide I always show if I'm allowed to talk about um, uh, clinical pharmacology in neonates because 
We tend to forget that because for, for us it's usable stuff, but it's not the case. The first year of life, the first months of life, the first weeks of life, it's an ex explosion. A baby which is born today will first lose weight. And when he's six weeks old, he will have gained 50% on top of his birth weight. When he's um, four or five months old, he will be doubled. And the end of the first year of life, he will be tripled his weight. That's a major effort. We actually do not want to repeat this anymore. But it does show that what we are commonly used to, that all these babies evolved significantly, also in their physiology and in their needs. So this means that, again, we are always shooting at a moving target. And it's not just the maturational things, preterm versus terms. It's all about diseases. If a baby is, uh, ha is, is undergoing whole body cooling because of, uh, of, of asphyxia, obviously this kidney will be dysfunctional. If a baby is treated with ibuprofen or in the medicine, obviously this kidney will be dysfunctional. Uh, but also assay may matter because you may not know, for instance, but if you take one blood sample in one given hospital for vancomycin, you send it around to 10 different hospitals, you will never ever get the same results. There will be variability for at least two to five milligrams in your measurement. So all these things are actually quite dynamic and we are not very sure, so we have to aim for the good target. One thing which is specific to babies is that their body composition differs, and this is terribly important if you consider distribution volume and matters if you go for aminoglycosides and also for vancomycin and perhaps a little bit for penicillins. And all that has to do with loading dose of high doses. And I tend to explain this as well, all respect to my babies, but it's actually the only thing that people uh, generally understand of my lecture or take home. Babies are born as jellyfish. 80% of a baby is water. If you would dry freeze a baby, you will end up with 20%. You should not do that. <laughs> but this means that a baby, that the weight of three kilo has a completely different meaning than if you weight another patient of a given weight because this body dif uh, composition differs. Why does it matter? Just to illustrate. You may still know from your clinical pharmacology courses distribution volume and never really understood it, but anyhow, it exists. Who cares? Huh? But imagine if you give the same dose a milligram per kilogram to a patient with a low distribution volume, the father, for instance, and his baby. I take the father because mothers during pregnancy also have difference in distribution volume, so it's intentional. So if you give the same dose to the father, he will end up with a high concentration in his body, while the very same dose in milligram per kilogram to his baby will end up with a much lower concentration. That's not rocket science, that's pure physics. But it matters, because if you subsequently have a look on what we are aiming for, for aminoglycosides, we aim to, high, to get a high peak concentration, because the target in general depends on how sensitive is your pathogen. And in general, it's said that the peak concentration should uh, be uh, somewhere about six up to eight uh, times above this MIC. That's the bacterial killing. Get in and then stay out. Stay out because toxicity, you all know that there has, well, likely, that there are renal issues and hearing related issues. This has to do with the lower concentration because there is a uh, given capacity to, uh, toxicity of aminoglycosides has to do with accumulation in your cells. And there's a given capacity. So whether you have 1,000, 100, or 10 in your blood, the capacity to accumulate is actually time dependent because this accumulation can only occur at a given rate. So this way, you simply have to wait until you have to give a second dose while to avoid toxicity and still have sufficient efficacy. So this is a little bit weird, but this is one of my teachers in clinical pharmacology, Jean-Paul Langendries already illustrated uh, last century, using data on babies which were uh, admitted at birth. So this is not yet covering postnatal age, but what you could nicely see, simply would like to focus on the two exter uh, extremes, below 28 weeks and term cases, 
What you indeed can see is this distribution volume is higher in the most immature babies compared to the mature babies. So it's not just babies being jellyfish compared to other patients. Preterms are more jellyfish compared to term babies. So against your gut feeling, this actually means that you have to give the highest dose, this is for, for uh, amikacin, the highest dose to the most immature baby. This doesn't make any sense. But it has to be because you have to want to reach this given P concentration. Subsequently, because renal clearance is an issue, you need to take a little bit more time to get rid of this drug. Obviously, and this is a TTS twin, even babies born at the same age, with the same gestational age, uh, with the same genetic background in their setting, they may differ. So any model will have difficulties to cover issues at birth, like, for instance, a baby with high drops, where you have even more water compared to the normal setting and a, a more limited kidney disease, a kidney function. Once we are born, kidneys start to mature, and it's actually quite interesting. And the way that I try to explain renal maturation is it's, it's just like lung in my opinion. But lung recruitment happens in a few minutes. Kidney recruitment takes a few weeks. But it's the same. It's not that the kidney becomes much larger, but the function of this kidney becomes much more effective. And this is data from my French colleague from Rachel Vieux, who nicely showed that GFR goes up with postnatal age. But you can say, well, yes, it goes up. But actually, you have a difference below. Here's 12. Here you have up in the 30s. So you have quite extensive variability again in clearance capacity. And this is reflected in model building. If you try to assess amicacin clearance, because this is one of my drugs that I have been working on quite a lot, you could see that indeed clearance is driven by characteristics at birth. Here's birth weight. Clearance is driven by characteristics after birth, postnatal age, four weeks. And again, quite an extensive variability. And clearance is also driven by other characteristics because these discontinuous gray lines reflect babies exposed to ibuprofen. And they have a reduced renal elimination capacity simply because of this drug. What about beta lactams? It's all about aim a given time above a MIG. And this is also reflected in dosing regimes. With all respect, I couldn't really retrieve the source of this document. So if this colleague is by accident in the room, please inform me so that at least I can pay respect to the people who did the work. But you could see over here for metopenem, again, difference in dosing driven by postnatal age and gestational age. So that's the concept behind it. The only thing that I would like to stress is if it is indeed correct that the time above MIC is the main driver of efficacy, why not give the same amount of drug over a longer time? As is modeled in this slide, you can either give it over 30 minutes or four hours, but the time above a MIC will be significantly different. I could say, well, does it matter? Yes, it does. There is some Egyptian study on cases with gram-negative sepsis. And I think it was about 100 cases, so quite a relevant group. And hey, they showed that mortality is much better in cases treated with this prolonged infusion. You can question a lot about studies, but the only thing is that for mortality, it's a dichotomous outcome variable. Either you're dead or you're not dead. And it's rather robust also. So I think this is good arguments, especially if you are in a setting that you have the impression that your treatment is failing, that you may also reconsider the way you give your drug. And now I would like to switch to vancomycin, if, uh, because I have prepared some questions, but I didn't figure out how to do it. So, but. so my questions to you is mainly, how do you give vancomycin in your unit? Do you give it intermittent or as a continuous infusion? Interesting to see. I, I, I expected a 60-40 type of uh, pattern. Um, 
And I will not really explore that, but the main message that I will get through is some, there are some hard believers on continuous, but two problems. First, you need continuous access to your patient, so you may end up with more lines to treat the child. And secondly, there is a rabbit, poor rabbit model, but there's a rabbit model who deliberately con contributed to uh, research. And actually what I showed over there is that the resistance was much more common emerging in the continuous administration. So we are for sure not yet out of the wood. I think I had a second question. I think the second question relates to the target. What vancomycin concentration do you target for? For the small group of people who use continuous infusion, I would like to inform them that then the target also change, purely based on mathematics. Uh, so that's actually the main point that I would like to make, is that the way you, uh, you, you administer a drug will also affect your target to aim for. The system does not yet have an opinion. Do we continue or? Yeah, I can tell it's 60% 10 to 15. Yeah. So the majority is the 10 to 15 target. 25% 15 to 20. Yeah. 25%. Yeah. Actually, to be honest, I do not know yet what a good target would be. But anyhow, can I get my slides back? Okay, so what actually is matters is this area under the curve. So the surface under the curve. So one message if you go for continuous administration, you should actually be aware, pending on the characteristics of this baby, that takes quite some time before the baby is really treated. So please do not forget loading those, especially if you go for continuous administration. But this is the area on the curve, and I still try to think that based on the way I read the literature at present, that intermittent is still wise, but we should shift a little bit our practices. I'm very much aware that this may be a little bit too small, but anyhow, these are the doses that we gave, never on target. These are the doses that we proposed, intermittent, and yes, you go for a loading dose first, and then you're on target and you're there. If you don't, you will end up with time needed until you get to steady state. That's how clinical pharmacologists called it. And actually, even more important for continuous administration, please do not forget the loading dose before you're on target. And this target differs because it's area under the curve. It's 400 divided by 24. It must be 16. I mean, this is not rocket science. This is mathematics. So be aware that if you change practices, that you should also change uh, your targets. So for trough levels, I confirm that the trough is in general between 10 and 15. This is actually based on adult MRSA pneumonia. So you can question what, what the hell has this to do with CNS blood infection, but this is how it is. But the reason that I kept this slide in is just to make you aware about steady state, because this is an error that I've been making for one and a half year and only afterwards understood it. So what we did at that time, this is Leuven work. Um, what we did at that time was give vancomycin twice a day, not good, but anyhow, People change with time. Uh, and we took a blood sample after 24 hours. But if you take it after 24 hours and without loading those, you're not yet at steady state, so you're too low. So what every doctor then subsequently will try to do is augment the dose, and actually what you do is end up way too high. So um, you have to realize that it takes time before babies get into steady state, so that you have to take care of the, on this concept before you're considering uh, to do TDM. And this is another suggestion of the same paper, but actually they indeed I highlighted again the loading dose because that's actually the main driver, be on target and then keep on target. Uh, and I try, still try to stick to intermittent administration. And sometimes 
it's complex. Linozolid, nobody knows why it is behaving like that in neonates. I have some experience with this drug in, in uh, Leuven, not in Rotterdam, but nobody knows. Irrespective of the gestational age, when you're two weeks old, you need another dose. So this does mean that we have to continue to do, also for the new antibiotics, to explore drugs. So I didn't want to make things complicated because things are coming to make our life a little bit easier. At least that's what I hope. Firstly, for study development, you can actually develop concepts also to make studies, clinical pharmacological studies in neonates much more easier, much more common. It's mainly driven by animal research, but also adults, and what we call PPPK models. That's, in essence, you t in PPPK model try to integrate everything we know on physiology of a baby, uh, body composition, renal function, this type of stuff, and then try to predict how a drug will behave. And in this way, you can actually quite do quite easily pharmacokinetics. A main message of this is, as in science, if you have a hypothesis, it's easier to prove it or to reject it, and you need much less patience and much less observation. So it makes it much more feasible. And this is the type of concepts. You learn, you try to develop modeling, you try to uh, improve modeling a little bit like weather forecasting. When you know the covariates, you can actually predict that. Important message for us clinicians is actually pharmacists or clinical pharmacists or online tools will help us. Because actually where we're heading for is not one dose in any population, for sure neither one dose in any subpopulation, but actually try to individualize your treatment, your administration as good as possible. And this is a model for gentamicin. There's also one lower for vancomycin. And lots of these software online tools are, are appearing in literature. And why does it matter? For us clinicians had different uh, add-on values. You can actually first make a prediction on what type of dose you will need. You subsequently can do a TDM and can subsequently adapt your treatment. That's not rocket science. It's to a large extent what we're already doing. But one of the main advantages is actually it doesn't matter anymore when you take your sample. You don't have to have a trough sample, which is convenient for us and also for the patient because you may also cluster sampling and reduce the burden of repeated blood sampling. And also, but that is out of our scope, obviously, for pharmacists, you can actually say, well, harvest all our samples in the morning, and we'll get you an advice by two in the afternoon. So in this way, you can actually facilitate and still have much better accurate treatment modalities. And this is just an illustration. I'm not sure if you can read it, read it but it's online available. This is uh, for gentamicin, where you actually simply can complete clinical characteristics like the size and the age of your patient and lower down the line also creatinine. So in this way, actually the model can say, well, the likelihood for give a dose is that. And then the next page is once you have a, 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 a TDM monitoring, a result, the system can say, yeah, I predicted this with this new information, please continue or please adapt a little bit. So in this way, we can actually have an online, much more clever study design and a much more better individualized care. As I alluded to, pharmacodynamics is not only about efficacy, it's also about toxicity. And there are some data where indeed prolonged antibiotic treatment is associated with adverse outcomes. So you should not feel comfortable by continuing antibiotics. You should feel very comfortable by continuing antibiotics and antibiotic in those who need it and stop it in those who don't need it anymore. This is one of the studies who showed that the composite outcome, but also late onset sepsis and death, again, quite robust outcome variables, were indeed higher in babies longer exposed to antibiotics. And same type of data also exists for necrotizing enterocolitis. Um, or just as an illustration, the duration of antibiotic treatments is associated with the death. I felt that this is a, a good way to show it because, again, we should give antibiotics to babies who need it, but also dare to stop if you don't have real arguments to continue treatment. And finally, as a sidekick, there's also some late long-term outcome variables. You may know in veterinary care that actually a uh, lot of animals get a lot of antibiotics. And in part, it is because they grow better. 
they gain weight much faster, so they can be sold faster if it is about, all about meat production. The same type of phenomenon you can see to a certain extent also in babies or infants exposed to antibiotics. They have a different body composition in later life, weight may, more pronounced in boys compared to girls, and more pronounced for, hate than, uh, for weight compared to hate. So yes, the BMI is higher, and this may be an indicator of uh, later metabolic uh, issues. So there's something over there that antibiotic exposure in early life, most pronounced for macrolides, indeed has also long-term outcome effects. Boom. Having said that, I think I've tried to convince you that antibiotics is fun, although it depends how you consider this, that improved knowledge and improved integrated knowledge on physiology and pathophysiology of neonates actually can help us to not give perhaps other or more sophisticated antibiotics, but give them the right way to give the, the most effect, uh, effective treatment and still avoid as best as possible uh, the toxicity. So I hope I confirmed you that indeed neonatologists are working at the first lane of developmental life. This is what we share and that is what we like. Clearance is low, but you have still to understand what are the drivers because this will determine your practices within your unit, this variability. And on antibiotics, it's not just when and what, but also how to prescribe. Thank you very much.